Good morning. Welcome to co-design, implementation, and improvement for dis disability youth justice with Carrie Bossas and Sarah Arby. I'm Sharice Pedcock with Results Washington. My pronouns are she, her, and I will be your moderator today. We have about 310 attendees registered for this session, and we're happy you're here. I'm joined today by Emily Dahl, who will be providing the ASL interpretation. And thank you to my team member, Alisa Julius, who is managing technology behind the scenes. I want to share a few things before we get started. We know many of you are familiar with Zoom meetings, but there are some differences in Zoom webinar, which we're using today. The biggest difference is that you won't be able to talk or have your video visible. This ensures all participants can focus on today's presentation. We want to draw your attention to a few different features in Zoom and how we'll use them. Move your mouse and the toolbar will appear. You can see the icons for the chat and Q&A. These are two different things. Chat will not be available during this session. And uh, Q&A will be used for this presentation. So if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A box. We won't be able to respond to all questions because there are 300 plus people uh, registered, but we will do our best to try and provide some answers. If you are experiencing technical issues, please use the Q&A feature and we'll do our best to help you. Next, you'll notice the icon for closed captioning. If you wish to see closed captioning, click that icon and then select show subtitle, or you can view the full transcript. You can adjust your view to make the presentation or your speaker larger by sliding the vertical bar on your screen from left to right. Session materials are available on our website and videos will be available in about a week. If we get disconnected or run into technical troubles, we will try to get the webinar back up within five minutes. If the event we can't do so, we will record the session at another time and put it up on our website for you to view later. Finally, at the end of the session, a survey will pop up. Please take the time to complete the survey this will provide the presenter with real-time feedback as well as Results Washington. So I'd like to welcome at this time, Carrie Bosses and Sarah Arby. This is Carrie. Cherie, so much. Thank you so much for that introduction. I, for access reasons, I'll provide a visual description of myself. I am a white woman in my mid forties with blonde hair in a bob and I am wearing a dress that has a honeycomb pattern to it. Today we're going to talk about a project that we did as a collaboration between our Office of the Education Ombuds, students, teachers, and other and researchers, all of which who had disabilities. You'll see that the project is called One Out of Five Disability History and Pride Project. The one and the five on the image to the right are in ASL, and we have the same in Braille below. We were lucky to have an artist do uh, silhouettes and in, in bright colors showing students of different ages and abilities and genders in the school setting. And the biggest image on this slide is of a blue silhouette of a boy who is looking towards the future, towards a book. 
thanks to Sarah, Julian, and Warren, they'll have a chance to introduce themselves and provide a description of their role as we get closer to the panel. We would like to acknowledge the land that we are on. I'm on the unceded ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. The other panelists today are joining from the lands of other tribal nations in Washington, such as the Yakima and the Cowlitz. We acknowledge the role that we have in building relationships that honor the land, its people, and tribal sovereignty. You can always find which lands you are occupying by going to this great website, native-land.ca. And I would also flag that our state office of the superintendent of public instruction has a wonderful curriculum called Since Time Immemorial to talk about the contributions, historical and current of our tribal nations in Washington. Our agenda today will be a project overview, design and use, the student perspective panel, which will occupy 25 minutes. We'll talk more about collaboration and evaluation through a continuous improvement lens, and then we'll take questions. So we'll be collecting questions through the Q&A throughout this process, and I'll make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. We want to center disability justice, and so in engaging today, we encourage you to attend to your body, mind, take breaks, engage in ways that restore you and center justice, honor the daily ongoing trauma of racism and anti-Blackness, be humble, always commit to action, and then learning is everywhere. And I think we have an opportunity to continue to learn from each other and we'll talk more about how we learned about our roles in this project. Briefly, because I want to spend most of the time on the student panel, we have the one out of five project that we'll describe more in this session. And we called it one out of five because 20% of people, at least 20% have disabilities. About four years ago, our office discovered that the legislature had passed a law requiring schools to teach about disability every October. And what we saw was there were no resources provided to do that. And I have a disability and I was talking to filmmakers with disabilities and educators with disabilities. And we said, how powerful would it be for us to create a resource for K to 12 that centered disabled and deaf experiences in student storytelling and using that as a launching point for developing curriculum. Uh, we developed five lessons, which Sarah will talk a little bit more about how they're being used that are freely available, open source. We produced six videos. The students are profiled here, students of different genders, races, disabilities, identities, and you'll hear from Julian and Warren. Julian is at the end of the first row um, signing hello, and Warren is sitting in his room uh, at the beginning of the second row. We really wanted to make teaching about disability easy and center disability voice and student voice and experience so that we didn't feed into a deficits model. One of the biggest things for us, and I'll first describe the image on the left. The image on the left is another silhouette uh, art that we had commissioned, and it's of a young man in blue looking towards the future, again, looking at a book with a bright, almost sunshine-like object behind him. Early on in our conversations about what this project could look like, how we could create something that would be of value to K-12 schools, we realized that we brought different expertise. Even though uh, 
everyone on the team either had a disability, was born with one, acquired one. We were grownups and didn't necessarily know what students' experiences were like. And we also brought different skills. Our office is strong in education policy and family engagement. Students know their own stories. Teachers bring the curriculum development piece. We worked with Ruta and Rights, which is a team of disabled filmmakers. And later we'll talk about our collaboration with the University of Washington College of Education to move towards both evaluation of what we had done as well as needs for changes and improvement. The results Washington team will drop a link uh, at the bottom or into the chat that allows you to access the project. And we hope that you'll spend some time with the learning resources and student videos. We've used them well beyond K to 12 and the student videos are about four minutes each. Unfortunately, we can't show the two student videos today. We don't have enough time. Our goal was really to center student voice. So I am going to transition to Sarah. Hope that Sarah and Julian and Warren can introduce themselves. And I know Sarah will describe the beautiful artwork on the left too. Yeah, thank you so much for that um, awesome introduction. To begin on the left of the slide is an image of Anita Cameron, a black woman with locks wearing an adopt or adapt beanie. And on the right next to her is a quote, civil rights are not given. You must fight to get them, then fight to keep them. And under the quote is another image of Anita sitting in her wheelchair holding an intercom next to a US flag, except for instead of stars and lines on the flag, it is the sign of a handicap symbol. And to the right of her are two men, police officers, arresting Anita. Um, and I, again, am Sarah Arby, wonderful to see you all. I'm a white woman with short, dark cropped hair, sitting in front of some beautiful artwork that my partner and niece made me. Um, so we are going to start with um, Warren and Julian when the their cameras come on. They'll say hello, introduce themselves and describe themselves visually. Awesome. Julian, do you want to start us out? Begin with an audio description of what you uh, look like and then introduce like a little bit about yourself. <clears throat> yes, hi there. My name is Julian. And I have glasses, black skin, and uh, dark hair. I'm wearing a hoodie. And uh, it's a zip up hoodie. And my background is uh, sort of kitchen, a refrigerator, and some books and things. Um, and I am deaf. And uh, that's who I am. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Warren? My name is uh, Warren Libert. Uh, I am wearing a plaid green shirt, wearing a flat cap, brown hair, white male Scottish heritage, and I have ADHD. Uh, and my background is just the night nice sky because I just find that personally calming myself. Thank you both for those wonderful audio descriptions. For folks who might not know, audio description is a point of accessibility that we really prioritize. Um, so as we get started, uh, Julian, why don't you start us off again, but both of you can answer, why did you choose to participate in one out of five? Yeah, I really enjoy representing the deaf community and my deaf culture. I, so I like the representation. And it's good for, yes, I appreciate the opportunity um, and exposure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Warren, how about you? Why did you choose to participate in one out of five? 
At first, personally, it was just because I wanted to share my side of the story to spread that awareness, even though if I didn't know what it was at the time. But now, I really feel like I have some kind of responsibility to help spread this awareness now for others that don't have the voice or just can't speak up because they feel like they can't. Yeah, thank you both so much. And I appreciate the ways that you're really centering that representation. Um, and so why do you think it's important to have that intersectional disability and deaf representation in schools? Yeah, it's important to represent um, deaf people and also other people, of course, with disabilities um, to show that we can do anything. And that, so for students, um, young students to look up to us older students and have that in their mind. Awesome, and Warren, what about you? Why do you think it's important to have intersectional disability and deaf representation in schools? So that we can learn about it more because multiple times at my school when I have mentioned that I have a disability my friends will look at me shocked or other classmates and I have to explain to them what it is I have what it is I do with this and that's exactly it. it's not talked about it. yeah thank you um and I really appreciate that too because I know for a lot of teachers that I've worked with um, and Carrie has worked with a lot of government leaders and organizations um, that really breaking that silence is an integral piece to um, kind of creating accessible and inclusive schools. And so how do you think government leaders and organizations be led by youth with disabilities and deaf people in designing their programs? How do you think that could impact the way that they're designing and thinking about their programs? Just looking here at the question. <clears throat> so I think it's important um, through our experience, they can, um, organizations and schools can look at this and provide more access like interpreting services. And I want um, them to notice that and understand that deaf people and any disabled group really um, can do anything and just spread the word that um, Deaf Awareness Month was uh, last month in September. So just for each disability, bringing awareness and having more recognition and acknowledgement for people in government. Yeah, and what do you think, Warren? Um, how do you think that government leaders and organizations, how could youth with disabilities and deaf people be more involved in designing their programs? Kind of like with what Julian said, where that they deaf people or people that have deaf disability will need interpreters. Something similar for me, where at school I am allowed to use a small iPad because because of my disability I cannot type. Fact, but using my words, my brain, just speaking into the microphone of an iPad that can help me million times better than typing with my hands. And it's just something small like that. Or another fun one, the, the uh, get free cards or stress free cards that I have at school, where that if I'm having a stressful time in class, pull one of these cards out. It's not really a card, it's a metaphor, but I'm allowed to leave the class, talk to a counselor or a teacher, if I'm feeling overwhelmed and then go back to class. And that helps me and they could do that for other people. Yeah, and I appreciate that both of you brought up access as a really crucial component of the ways that government leaders and organizations and teachers can be thinking about the leadership of disabled youth and deaf people in their programs. And so really taking those access needs into consideration and thinking of that, are there ways that you think we could improve this project or different ways 
um, that people could use this project towards those goals? This is Julian, yes, um, definitely. I think having more access, as we just said, um, for deaf people and anybody with disabilities is important to have that, have services such as interpreting services, ramps, accessibility physically. Um, it's important as was just mentioned by worn iPads or other technology devices. And hiring more um, individuals, um, per people who, ha who have gone through the experience, who have lived experience, um, who have disabilities. And so young children can look up to these adults and say, wow, they're just like me, we're the same and making sure that um, people with disabilities are able to be included completely. And also <clears throat> I've experienced um, one time um, in a driver's class that I was taking, <clears throat> I had to pay um, for my own interpreter. That's what they said, because they wouldn't allow, they wouldn't provide an interpreter for me. So they told me I had to pay for that on my, out of my own pocket. So those kinds of things are what I think we need access for, for services to be covered completely. And that's not the way it is right now. Um, so just those kinds of things, more access is really the key. Yeah, and Warren, what do you think about that as well? Can you think of ways that we can improve this project um, and like take, bring it into more spaces to make your messages even stronger? I'd say bring it into school at a much younger grade. And because of that, my mom knew I had ADHD since I was born and around for for fifth grade, uh, she was trying to get me to do, like I said, with the iPad, some way where I could speak into a microphone and then it can print it on a computer on like a Word document. And she tried that for three years and the school did not allow her to do that. And I think that really affected my grades during that time. And exactly just that's one way we can improve it. We one way you can prove it, I'll do this. Uh, have people learn it at a younger age so that way they become more aware. Don't wait until my age, because right now in high school, junior high, I have not been learning about disabilities or any of that until now. Why now? Why not when I was in third grade or fourth grade? Why now? Why wait all this time? That's my perspective, but that's one way to improve it. Yeah, thank you both for sharing. Um, and I wonder if, and you've spoken to this a little bit with the tips that you can provide, but I wonder how educators and uh, administrators can better support disabled and deaf students. And both of you talk about this in your student voice videos. Um, as well as you shared a couple ideas here, but especially for the people on the call, a lot of people want to be taking, you know, your perspectives into account first. So as much uh, as we can let them know how to better support disabled and deaf students, the better. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I think having more um, deaf schools um, in Washington state, I mean, it's limited the resources. I feel that um, some parents um, who don't want to let go of their kid from wherever they live, maybe say in Seattle and or anywhere within the state, any region um, within Washington to allow them to go to a state school, you have to let them go and they have to be in Vancouver, which is very far away. And so that's difficult. So I think more access um, with deaf schools, more than just WSD, the Washington State School for the Deaf, we need more of these. And so also in public schools, um, I think um, elementary schools starting there, it's been so frustrating for me um, not having access and having all of these barriers in my way. And when I transitioned um, here to a deaf environment, I felt so much better 
Um, I back then I couldn't communicate. It was really frustrating. There were all the barriers in here. It was a total relief. Communication is free and easy. I can talk directly to my teachers. There are interpreters if um, I need to speak to someone else. So I really wish there were more deaf schools in Washington State. And also, um, I wish there were more deaf teachers, honestly, in public schools. There are, there are few. And so I just feel that when you're talking or seeing your teacher that's deaf like you, it would make you feel um, reassured and it would be good as a role model for anyone with disabilities um, that would feel the same way. And so that representation, just having more adult role models that have experienced the same things I, I'm experiencing. And, um, you know, to inspire us, especially. So, yeah, that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, and Lauren, what are you thinking about when you see that question? Pretty much the same thing Julian was just saying is that having teachers or fellow students that have my disability or disabilities like it can give me some kind of a role model to look up to. Like, uh, like at my parents' job where they work, there's a guy there, his name's Tim, and I didn't know it until I was told, but he has ADHD like me. And I always got along with him before. And then after that, it made me realize why I was able to get along with him so well. And now I look at him as a role model. Like he's fully grown up. He has a job. He takes his uh, medication like I do for my ADHD. He does all this stuff. And that gives me some hope for myself where I can look up to him and be like, I could be him. I can be that when I'm older. Yeah, thank you both so much. Um, really appreciate it. And obviously you're centered in the one out of five project. And that's the reason that many folks are here today. I wonder if you have any last thoughts before we move to sharing a little bit more about the impact of the project and then going to Q&A with the group. This is uh, Julian for me now, no last thoughts. And I did just get a Q&A in the chat though that actually is you for you, Julian, so if you don't mind me asking, um, do you feel if the public schools had better setups for you, would you want to intend a public school or still um, the school for the deaf that you're currently in? Yeah, well, to be honest, I would um, rather come to the school for the deaf at WSD um, because the peers, my friends here, the teachers are like me. Um, and, um, you know, you can also have friends also in public schools, but I can do this without interpreters here. And, um, and so here, the more of the access is available. So for me, honestly, I prefer here, even with better services there, um, but just having, um, you know, parents want to give their kids um, a good education, but it can, this school is far from many. So I wish there were just more options. Um, yeah, and um, we also, got asked like, how do you think, as both of you talked about the importance of representation, how do you think we can widen our recruitment to reach and interview and hire people with disabilities and deaf people? Um, for me, I feel like um, spread the word, the knowledge, get it out there. Um, and um, I don't know, just get, you know, more deaf students, uh, you know, groom them to be teachers, it's, it's difficult, I know. Yeah, and what about you, Lauren? Uh, Julian uh, basically took the words out of my mouth. There's nothing I can really add to that, but yeah. Awesome, thank you both again. 
Um, we're going to all explain a little bit more about the impact of the project. And as folks listen, feel free to continue to type questions into the Q&A. And Warren and Julian will invite you back to answer some of those questions um, at the end. All right. See, OK, we can go to the next slide um, to talk a little bit more about our impact by the numbers. So while we're providing some of the initial numbers that we've been able to record throughout the process of the creation and implementation of one out of five, there's no real way that we have to fully track how many teachers were using these resources. Um, because on our website, there are five lessons available. One, an introduction to disability. Two, intersectionality. Three, disability history in the United States. And then to Washington specific, disability history in Washington. And finally, a lesson on allyship and solidarity. And so while the website unique views and the YouTube views give us insight into how it may be maybe um, being used, we're not fully aware of the uh, ways that folks might be accessing it. So our website had 19,176 unique page views. The YouTube videos, which feature Warren, Julian, and four other youth with disabilities had 14,288 views. On Facebook, we've been able to reach 25,380 and 3,007 of those have really engaged in the Facebook page. Um, as for the presentations that we've recorded, we've done at least 29 events that have reached over 39,000 participants. And as far as teacher education courses, we've used teacher or we've used one out of five in at least three teacher education courses specifically, but also across some of our teacher education programs more broadly. And so on the next slide, we'll be talking a little bit more about the um, evaluation and why we chose to collect data from multiple perspectives. So because of the ways that the uh, one out of five project was distributed more broadly. We wanted to make sure we were gathering perspectives from multiple stakeholders when we are thinking about evaluation and improvement. So we began by using data from one out of five being used in coursework with in service teachers getting their masters in education and asked about their experience implementing one out of five in their classrooms. And from there, we wanted to learn a little bit more from in the moment of why and how teachers were using one out of five. So we had a classroom volunteer to let us learn with them. With that pilot classroom, I was able to observe a class learning through one out of the five and then interviewed the teacher and six of the students about what they learned and why they thought it was important and how they thought teachers and students could utilize this knowledge moving forward. Thinking about the ways that um, one out of five was being used also helped us think about how we wanted to reflect and center youth with disabilities and deaf youth. And so we interviewed three of the youth that were featured in the student voice videos and asked them about whether one out of five aligned with the goals and their perspectives and experiences. Because we had already recorded what teachers had been done or what we saw in classrooms, we were able to ask very specifically about whether what teachers and students were appreciating aligned with what um, the youth featured in the student voice videos were hoping. And finally, we also wanted to broaden to the disability justice community so we interviewed four disability justice activists. And all around this, we were asking like, what did, um, sorry, did we make what we thought we did? And how can it be better? And who can tell us? And so on the next slide, you can see our themes. 
Our themes were um, the stigma of disability and breaking that silence, which I think Julian and Warren spoke really brilliantly to. And so the creators of One Out of Five, all of whom have disabilities, as well as the youth featured in the student voice video and disability justice activists desired the, or sorry, identified the desire to break the silence around disability. Um, because when people aren't talking about disability, they felt like that perpetuated a stigma. And so based on the reflections of the teachers and students, they also felt that when they were able to engage with these lessons, um, they, were able to reflect on their teaching practices and kind of co-construct knowledge with their students. And students with and without disabilities really appreciated having a space to talk openly about disabilities because they had curiosities, they had questions, and there hadn't yet been space in their educational experience to really discuss those openly. Which kind of led to the next theme, which was the importance of disability identity and community. And so having a curriculum that positively represented disability also brought kind of a positive development of disability identity and community, which Warren and Julian also spoke really beautifully to, both in that the whole one out of five team had disabilities. And so within the project, we were building community as well as students throughout the process were able to find other individuals who shared their identities. Um, and again, that was also represented in the classroom data that we collected. Teachers reported students uh, with disabilities being more open and sharing about their disabilities. When I observed there were students with disabilities that proudly related to the videos and would share their access needs. Um, and so then students were set up to really support one another, learn about one another and create communities in meaningful ways. And that kind of contributed to new conceptions of inclusive school environments. So centering the perspectives and experiences of students with disabilities really opened up opportunities to think about what does access mean? You know, and Warren and Julian both talked about the importance of access, of addressing those barriers that show up in our schools and ensuring that we're creating accessible and inclusive school settings. Um, and so from there, teachers and students alike were excited about these possibilities. And talking, talking about disability was a really integral step towards creating transformative inclusive education um, that we were all invested in. And so it was really amazing to hear, um, you know, teachers who also, some of whom had disabilities, some of whom did not have disabilities, students um, who were learning with one out of five who had disabilities or didn't have disabilities. And then on the one out of five team, all of whom have disabilities and the dis disability justice activists had a stake and had an interest in ensuring that access was at the center of our practices, that inclusion was prioritized, um, and that we were working towards that together while centering or continuing to center um, folks with disabilities and deaf people. And so we'd love to open it up um, on the next slide and thinking about kind of our potential expansions and thinking about ways that we can utilize what we learned throughout this process to really support um, students with disabilities and deaf students in school as well as in community. And so some of the ideas or potential expansions that we've thought of through the process is additional teacher training um, and so while we've been able to reach folks through some of the processes in teacher education courses or presentations at teacher conferences, we'd really love to be able to expand that and think about what does training look like at a school-wide level? What does it look like at a district-wide level? And the other space that we would love to learn more about 
is around youth advocacy. And so that could look like um, creating community spaces, affinity spaces for disabled and deaf students, ensuring that we have um, their experiences and perspectives at the center of our conceptions of what inclusive and accessible schools look, feel, and sound like. Um, and so again, really centering that youth advocacy, both within our affinity spaces, as well as advocating outside of those to include disabled and non-disabled people in transformative practices. And so I think we're gonna stop sharing the slides now, if I'm correct, Carrie. Um, and you're gonna guide us in some of the Q&A that's come up. Yes, this is Carrie. And thanks so much to Julian, Warren, and Sarah. I just wanted to note, I, you know, we have, Sarah mentioned that we want to focus um, and center disability justice and access. And certainly over time, we have learned about each other's access needs and we're continuing to improve in that, in that way too. So it may be new to you for people to present and describe what they look like. In fact, I sometimes joke with others that you're kind of wondering why is that lady talking about what she's wearing? But when we think about audio description of slides, for example, what we're trying to do is create the same access to the material that you're seeing if you aren't blind or don't have a vision impairment as someone who is blind or has a vision impairment would offer. You'll see that also in the videos that we created. Um, some people have noticed it, but there will be a description of meaningful content, right? You're not going to describe every little thing on the wall, but what's happening. So someone who is watching it who's blind can um, get a great picture in their minds of what's happening. So we hope that you'll check out the videos in that way. I also wanted to share and we'll keep lighting up the Q&A that one of the challenges in this project, right, is COVID hit. We made student videos before then, but when we were thinking about continuous improvement, we had made these resources thinking about a traditional school environment. So one thing our team did is, I think Sarah mentioned that we got a community-based action uh, research grant through Unite Ed at UW College of Education. And we came together and one of the byproducts during COVID was creating resources focused on disability and COVID, doing modifications for remote learning and talking about the Black Lives Matter movement and how important it was, how important it is, and then how much racial justice needed to be centered during this time. So I just wanted to highlight some of the ways in which we continue to learn from each other. And we've continue to adapt to what we're hearing from what teachers have said, students have said, and Sarah and others research. So it has been wonderful to be part of a community, as Sarah mentioned, a team. Sarah, do you want me to read some of the questions or do you want to take care of that? Yeah. I could read them aloud if you want. Yeah, that's great. I was gonna say either way. Okay, well, either way works too. <laughs> so, um, Joel made a comment that uh, his 12 year old daughter is autistic and he has found a mixed bag in public schools that she has attended. Many teachers have different interpretations of what an accommodation means. And what kind of investment do you think is needed in the state to make sure educators understand what is required for accommodating students? I think all of you could speak to that. This is uh, Julian. So this, um, yeah, so this is where people need it, whether it's deaf, a deaf person would need um, an audiologist, um, someone with ADAD, ADHD, for example, may need an iPad. So someone with autism needs other things. I'm not sure exactly what, but each specific disability has their own needs and that needs to be looked at. And the school should be aware that the person with the disability is going to need resources. Uh, 
uh, yeah, just like Julian said, uh, everyone needs that different whatever. Because like back to um, earlier with Tim, my my parents' coworker, I had a talk with him, and he talked about how well he didn't really grow up with that uh, with all of that fancy stuff I have now, the iPad, the uh, the card to walk out of class, but. He said he found out his own way. He didn't explain it. I asked him. He said he didn't remember, but he found a way. And he says exactly it. He said we all find a way that we can all help help ourselves. And that could be anything. That could just be a mentality. Like think about your mentality, what you can do to fix a problem or just the right resources, stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, if you don't mind, Carrie, sorry, this is Sarah, just one more. Because I was gonna say another thing that comes up when thinking about accommodations um, is the importance of teachers having access to IEPs, individualized education programs, um, but also recognizing that students might have access needs, whether temporary or long-term that are not documented in IEPs. So while IEPs are really important documents towards students' educational rights, also having that disability justice lens of thinking about um, what can't be captured necessarily in a document is super important to take into account. And that means asking. That means working with the student, with the family, um, and trying new things, being creative. This is Carrie. Thank you all so much for that. Um, one thing I just always think about is disability is exacerbated, sometimes caused by interactions with our environments. So Warren mentioning that someone else had to find a way to get through. I don't like to talk about disability in inspiring or um, simplistic terms, but I do think about the incredible resourcefulness that is needed because you don't know what you're going into either at school or at work. And um, we're in a world where we're often asked to just figure it out rather than someone building in that access from a, ba from a baseline. Um, so I was wondering, we have another comment here. We have some other questions coming in too that I have in, in separate chat. Lori says uh, that she appreciates you all for standing up and talking with us today. She would like to see more programs in schools. Warren mentioned that he did not learn about disabilities until he was older. And she agrees that it should be taught at lower levels in schools, that they should also be given the opportunity to learn ASL while young to communicate with their peers. And kudos to you all for talking with us today. I don't know, it's not really a question. It's more an affirmation and agreement. I don't know if anyone has a response to that that they would like to share, or if you'd like me to move on to the next question. This is Carrie again, you're getting some love uh, in the Q&A. Uh, Christina mentioned that she appreciates the work you're doing to help educate people about disabilities. She's been an advocate for her daughter since birth. And so it hits so close to home and she loves the idea of educating people at a young age in the school curriculum. And Laura writes, as a mother with kids that have disabilities, I find it is a struggle to get teachers to understand the needs my kids have. With my daughter, she's on the spectrum of autism and I focus on the IEP to ensure her success. With that being said, she is low on the spectrum. So I find that they tend to forget about the needs and the IEP. Does anyone have any response to that? Maybe in ways that you feel like people have minimized your access needs or the supports because you appear to be doing so well. Yeah, this is Julie and I think that's completely wrong that teachers um, would do that. Um, and there's no reason why they wouldn't pay attention to what's in there. I mean, some, there are needs and they shouldn't just minimize it. Um, it's just unfair.
uh, more in here. Uh, I can relate to this slightly as ADHD is a off brand of autism in a way. And I have had this happen to me uh, where I would show up to class, pull out the uh, iPad, whatever, and then get told, you can have that here. And the way I did this was basically get the IEP and basically talk to the office and basically say, this is it. This is it right here. I have the, I, like, I have the piece of paper. I shoved it in their face. Metaphorically, I shoved it in their face saying, this is my IEP. I am allowed to do this stuff. I am allowed to have the iPad in here and use it in the class as a tool, just like a Chromebook, just like a textbook, just like a notebook for writing down notes, anything. This is a tool I have. If you take this away from me, you're literally violating my rights. But that's the way I figured because I am stubborn and I like to face my problems head on. So maybe you could find something else. Yeah, this is Sarah. Thank you both, Julian and Warren. Um, I think also as special education teachers, it's really important to include students in the process of writing an IEP um, to ensure that they know what's on there. And like Warren said, that those are their educational rights. Those are their civil rights. Um, and to have a team. So while it's beautiful and teaching self-advocacy skills is essential, also there are folks who like have your back. who are gonna also come and say, hey, like this needs to be happening um, for legality reasons, for students feeling a sense of belonging, for students being able to access content and material. Um, and so also ensuring that teachers know that accommodations are there to support and engage students, which many of us prioritize, or I should hope we do. One question that I also received was, how can leaders make space so that people can share what their needs are? In a way, I would assume that's not stigmatized or questioned or judge. You all, surprisingly to me, I keep getting older, Julian and Warren, and so you'll be thinking more about college and employment and other things. And so I'm just thinking outside of the school classroom, how would your future employer make that space for you? <clears throat> hmm. That's a hard question. I haven't thought much specifically about that. Um, let's see. Hmm. Maybe by having um, slow things down. I mean, I think that, you know, if it's a hearing person, I would need to pick things up as I go. And yeah, just slow things down because I am deaf and maybe I'd be, have to work twice as hard sometimes than my hearing peer because I have to figure out communication in a different way. And so I think that maybe by slowing things down, that would help. And of course, um, having notes writing on, uh, for a future employer writing on paper or texting or something, just finding ways to get an interpreter to communicate with me would be really helpful. For a future job for myself, uh, I guess it would be, that kind of like Julian said, take it slow so that when I'm not overstressed by the work they may have me do, but also maybe just allow some slack here and there. Because for my IEP at school, I'm allowed to turn in an assignment one day after it's supposed to, because ADHD, to put it in a goofy way, I procrastinate. I will do it at the last minute or just for, or I will just completely forget about it. So there's that that a employer could do in the future is just give me some slight slack or just give me more time to work on it. Cause I can get that assignment done. They give me. 
it would just take more time than they would expect. This is Carrie, we're almost at time. Um, I see that Jennifer, who's the parent of kids with disabilities mentioned that she tees up the teachers by giving them a brief overview of her children's 504 plans. So that's accommodation plans and IEPs just to, um, and that usually things go well after she makes herself available to answer those. Given that we're in the end, um, oh, you got more love uh, from a sibling of a disabled adult and there's a lot of love coming in. Um, what, we could wrap up by say, asking, I'd love to ask you three, who else should be using these materials besides K to 12 teachers? I would say uh, people in work settings, like work partners and um, just even, I mean, anyone, strangers, you never know, just anyone it can reach. Um, someone you cross that, um, that just don't know about this information that could be exposed to it. Um, about people with disabilities saying, please don't, you know, just walk away because um, we have these experiences and don't turn away from it. Um, just because I'm deaf, you know, people just um, not in, don't include me but, and they will literally walk away. And so just, um, I would say to people, please just try to communicate with people who have disabilities without just walking away and not bothering to do it. Um, so maybe you'll see deaf people. You could see deaf people anywhere in a work setting, um, anywhere. So we're everywhere. That's it. This is Carrie. Thanks so much. That's such a great note to take us out on. Sharice, you're up. So thank you, Carrie, Sarah, Julian, and Warren for a beautiful and inclusive session and for sharing ways government leaders and organizations can be of better support, remove barriers, and increase access. Thank you to Emily for interpreting this session and thank you to all of you for being here today. There's more of the conference to come. So visit our website and you can revisit sessions that you may watched or you missed and download materials and things and sign up for more sessions. In a second here, a survey will pop up. Please take a moment to complete the survey. We really want your real-time feedback and thank you for attending. Have a great day.